very pleased to be able to introduce our speaker, Dr. Tess Mercia from University of Cincinnati and Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Um, Dr. Mercia is an associate professor of pediatrics uh, whose research is focused on understanding the uh, complexities between genomics and the environment and contributing to complex disease, especially asthma and asthma-related allergic diseases. Um, his work, I uh, was struck strike by how interdisciplinary it is, spanning bioinformatics and machine learning techniques, genetics and genomics, environmental science, racial disparities, and personalized medicine. Um, he received his PhD in quantitative genetics from the University of um, Göttingen, I don't know, Germany. I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly. Um, after which he did a, a postdoc in human and statistical bioinformatics at University of Alabama in Birmingham. I uh, then spent two years at Medical College of Wisconsin as a research associate in human genomics uh, before beginning his tenure track position in 2010 at University of Cincinnati. Um, he's received several awards during his career, including a Keystone Symposia Early Career Investigator Award and the 2017 African Professionals Network Business and Professional Achievement Award. Um, I think the titles of some of his most recent 2020 publications illustrate um, his fascinating work and the wide breadth that it has as well. For example, one of them is titled uh, Air Pollution, Racial Disparities and COVID-19 Mortality. Another is Unraveling Racial Disparities and Asthma Emergency Department Visits Using Electronic Health Records and Machine Learning. Um, Dr. Marsh has several other very interesting senior author publications, even just this year. Um, and I'm not sure which he's planning to present today, but I'd be very happy <laughs> to hear about any of them. So without further delay, um, go ahead and, and take it over, Tess. Thank you so Thank much you for, for your introduction. Uh, can you hear me, Klaus? Yes, sounds so, good. Thank you so much for the nice introduction. I'm really blessed to to talk to you all. I wish I had the opportunity to visit in person, hopefully in the future. Uh, so I, I'm going to tell you uh, some of our work related to uh, really uh, the genomics and uh, environment are related to racial disparities and uh, taking asthma as an example. And uh, by no means, this is limited to asthma. Some of the things are very general and, and can be uh, apply to uh, other uh, outcomes. So uh, my work is, uh, th this is the, the general framework of my research. Uh, as you can see, uh, we focus on um, uh, asthma division of asthma research. Uh, and, but we uh, typically do uh, other things related to allergy, eczema or atopic dermatitis, uh, food allergy and EOE. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm lucky enough to work with uh, very senior and talented clinicians here at Children. So uh, we have really uh, well uh, 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 organized, I would say, uh, well developed uh, clinical cohort for multiple outcomes here at Children. So uh, as you can see from uh, a different kind of uh, different box here, I do uh, from genetic study. This is primarily using our own study population uh, association, admixture, some of this I will be talking a little later. And uh, we also have gene expression right now. We have uh, RNA-seq. Uh, we all heavily do data mining. Uh, as you must know, uh, uh, there is rich resources actually these days. It's, uh, it's, it's, you know, mining data really generates a re more interesting information than just using one study population. So there's a lot of resources in the public domain. We also have collaboration with uh, related to epigenom uh, social epigenomics uh, grant with here in children. I also work with microbiome, uh, a collaborator in Israel, uh, especially looking immigrants, how people immigrated from different regions, especially from developing country to the Western hemisphere, how their microbiome uh, changes, which leads actually on higher or a, a higher risk in, in allergy, uh, including asthma. 
uh, I would say much of my work and my grants are related to ancestry. Uh, we always look our study population from ancestry, looking the, what the ancestry variation, either in global or local ancestry perspective. We also develop some tools in our lab. Uh, these tools are primarily to support our own research, but it happened that a lot of people around the world is interested in, in it as well. So these are some of the tools that we develop in our lab recently. So uh, especially uh, focus actually uh, is uh, uh, ancestry in minor. Uh, we developed like in 2012, there's over 20,000 uh, users around the world right now. So this is uh, particularly to identify markers that are informative to ancestry. We also develop uh, a power analysis for admixed population. As you know, most power analysis are European based or, or homogeneous population. We develop um, tools that can be helpful for grant application or others using uh, uh, this tool called Admix Power. So we have an other tools, some are related to uh, multi omics data, uh, but um, really it's, it's the interest comes within our own group. So we found it, uh, uh, we, other people uh, use it really extensively as well. Uh, some of the problem uh, uh, with uh, uh, these days with the tools that you find online is that most tools are developed uh, by computer scientists and and it's very hard to to use it in a way that you are interested in. So these are the very friendly tools that uh, you can apply in your own work. So I'm not going to talk about that tools today, but the the the, the main emphasis for today is uh, some of the learning objection uh, objectives I mentioned here. What is the conceptual distinction or clinical utility of self-reported race ethnicity? and genetic ancestry. As you, as you all know, we sometimes uh, interchangeably use race, ethnicity, or sometimes ancestry in most of our social life. So what, what about in terms of our specific research? So uh, is there any role in genetic ancestry, socio-environmental factors? I'll talk a little bit on that, some of the results. And uh, I would briefly mention in, in our effort to develop a polygenic risk score, uh, I would say ancestry specific polygenic risk score in terms of asthma, which is really a way to forward to in a pers uh, precision medicine initiatives, especially in a diverse minority population where studies are really limited. Of course, there's also challenge opportunities. I will mention that and lastly, uh, I will discuss some of the <coughs> home, me home tech messages. So uh, to just brief introduction, uh, I know most of you uh, work on this area. I'm not going to go to the details, but you know, in terms of basic definition, why uh, at all we care about race, ethnicity or ancestry at all. So the reason is because there is a difference in terms of well-being, well uh, a difference that show by race. There is a racial disparity. That's why we are interested to know why there is a difference in terms of race. So the formal definition uh, is that, you know, you know race, race Yes, please. So uh, in terms of race is defined as, uh, uh, you know, uh, based on physical attributes. It's more a social construct uh, uh, as always in the literature and as you hear, <laughs> there's no biological base of race uh, in terms of uh, category. Ethnicity, it's more of, you know, grouping based on either language or, or, or physical religion or country of region, origin. So somebody with different racial groups could originate from the same country and could be classified in the same uh, ethnicity. So this is a more uh, broader uh, aspect of this classification. <coughs> Ancestry on the other hand, that we are looking specifically the, the DNA, the line of descent. So it's more of uh, particularly looking at the DNA of a given individual. So uh, when, we, when you say, when you report or when you recruit a patient based on self-reported dress, basically we are uh, considering this as a confounding variable where we are talking about uh, all of this in, in self-reported subjects. 
So, but as you all know, uh, so race and, and ethnicity is not really, a, 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 it's not a, a dichotomy or it's not a, a qualitative threat. It's a more a continuous uh, paradigm, as you can see, it's a gradient. So uh, the problem is when we try to, uh, to, to categorize and give a box for each racial groups, we are ending somebody who doesn't have a specific group is going to be in a different group and that's going to affect our uh, statistical analysis, especially in genetic terms. So uh, self-reported race are mostly based on skin color and the skin color is, is known to be a poor indicator of uh, ancestry. So the good example is, this is an example why that's a poor indicator. So uh, the Mr. Joseph is a self-identified uh, black for, he's uh, uh, 65 years old now. He's a uh, principal in uh, high school in Los Angeles area. So uh, he was, uh, you know, he, he was uh, not sure uh, what to do with his, uh, his ancestry. And he got his ancestry tested in ancestry.com. And what turns out to be, you know, as you can see from his ancestry analysis, actually he has no African ancestry, although he self-identified black in his entire life. So he was, he had, I listened to his interview and he said he's already 65 years old, but he doesn't know what to do with his uh, kids. So you can imagine what uh, misleading will be if you look at self-identified race, especially if you are looking genetic study, particular loci in this person and you assign that person as black. The same is true for Ms. Persley. She also identified, uh, she identified uh, white, but uh, looking her genetic ancestry, she has uh, eight to 9% African descent. So uh, it's relatively, compared to uh, uh, the, the previous example, it's relatively small, but still, you know, eight, nine, 10% of uh, uh, mixed means, uh, you know, some of the low size that cause a particular uh, disease could come from this person rather than from the other ancestry. So that has something with, uh, to do with uh, what we call in ad mixture mapping uh, framework. So the common question one would ask in uh, when it comes to race and ancestry that can we, a one can clinician or can we determine a person race from his DNA or RNA or his DNA or her DNA? So if somebody gives you sample or blood and look at his DNA and extract his, uh, you know, look at his DNA, can you say that person is black or not? And of course the answer is no. So are there the specific genes there is no risk specific gene. What does skin color tell you about a person, ethnicity, or ancestry? Of course, uh, this is also, uh, you know, th 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 those are skin color are related to adaptation. And it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, anyone who adapts in a different country, a different geographical uh, origin could have different colors modified. So it doesn't tell you really purely the ancestry of that individual. Can ancestry substitute for defining race or, or, or vice versa? Uh, the answer is no. Is ancestry rather than a better predictor of race? Uh, no, rather, I think uh, when you try to predict risk, uh, risk uh, both are really important. I'll come to that later. Is known uh, patient risk helps the clinician to make uh, accurate diagnosis? Of course, knowing the risk is important, but it may not be the whole story. So I think we need to have more than risk information. Although risk brings some of the environment specific uh, factors, there is other things that we need also consider. So uh, nowadays we have this precision medicine initiative. So we do really focus on race or ancestry. In my view, it's not one or the other. We need uh, more than race and ancestry. Uh, in fact, we need both, but we need more than this as well. So uh, uh, I, will, I will play a little video about race ethnicity and hopefully it works here. Excuse me for the video audio to work. You need when you share your screen, you need to check the box. Can you hear? You don't hear that? Um, no, there's a box when you reshare your screen again, and there's a, a little check box that to share computer audio. 
Oh. Okay. Uh, should I uh, unsure first? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, when you share, there's a little checkbox at the bottom of that window that share your computer audio. And you click that before you continue with this. Uh, say share computer sound, is that? Yes, sir. Okay. Let's see. Groups have any reliable basis? Yes, you guys hear that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Does the concept of race itself have any biological basis? In articles about genetics, race, and healthcare in professional journals and in the public media. But do our traditional conceptions of racial groups have any reliable basis in biology? Does the concept of race itself have any biological basis? And what does our growing understanding of human genetics and genomics tell us about this question? And what about the use of racial categories in the clinical setting and in biomedical research? Is it warranted and helpful? Or is race such a muddled concept that its use can confuse practitioners and clinical investigators alike? The best evidence we have at present is that modern Homo sapiens arose in Africa about 100,000 years ago, at which point there may have only been 10,000 founders, and we're all descended from that common set of ancestors. So we're all part of the same species. We all have the same set of genes. But each of us has different variants of those genes, about 0.1% of our DNA, to be exact, that differs between people. And some of those variants can be important in terms of predisposition to disease or adverse reactions to medications. So that's the medical importance of understanding human variation. Now, as people migrated out of Africa in various migrations to Europe, to Asia, gene flow, genetic migration occurring, these variations got spread around in different ways. And one consequence of that is that some variants are more common in one part of the globe and some in others. In many instances, that's just because of something we call genetic drift. That is, the variants weren't positive or negative in terms of their benefit. But just by drifting, they got more common in one place than the other. So if you look at a particular spelling difference, you might find it at a 40% frequency in Asia, and a 20% frequency in Europe, and a 30% frequency in Africa, and that wouldn't be surprising. But if you look between populations and say, how much of the genetic variance is actually accounted for by the fact that this population is over here and this one's over there, it's actually a pretty small fraction, only about 10%. Most of human genetic variation is, in fact, found within whatever group you look at. So the similarities between groups are actually profound, and the differences are relatively modest. Now, in some instances, a particular variant has actually provided an advantage to those who carry it. For instance, individuals who carried variants in certain genes where malaria was common, uh, when those variants provided protection, were likely to survive and therefore to pass those variants on. And so, for instance, particular variants in the hemoglobin genes, such as sickle mutation or thalassemia, or in other genes, like the G6PD gene, allowed individuals to do better if infected with malaria. And so those have reached a high frequency in parts of the world where malaria was common, but not so much in other parts of the world. So the bottom line is, we're all a lot alike. Genetic variation is only 0.1% of our DNA. There is some variability in terms of what you see in different parts of the world, and some of that may play a role in why some groups are more at risk or more protected for a particular disease. This makes it important, as we're doing biomedical research, to use defined populations so that we can understand the effect of genetics and environment and be sure when we make an inference whether or not it can be extrapolated to other groups. Very good. Uh... As you heard from Franz Collin, the director of NIH, so uh, it's uh, uh, an interesting concept to look at the uh, race and ethnicity in term and ancestry. So, what are the under what conditions should we dress? Now, you know, we we we, we discuss about the definitions. Francis mentioned uh, the tiny differences uh, uh, 
between racial groups and it has no biological basis. And do we need to ignore it at all or is there any way we need to consider? So in my view, uh, we, we need to uh, still utilize the, I, the, the, the race, race classification for example, uh, in health disparity, you know, uh, as far as there is unequal treatment or uh, perceived uh, uh, racial difference, that we need to study those, uh, take racial information into consideration. And there is also non uh, genetic. Uh, cause of health disparity, as I as we mentioned, environmental risk factors, the neighborhood factors where you know different racial groups live, whether that's polluted or or deprived, or is a green space in that area. So those are the non-genetic factors that really contribute to risk. So uh, I, the, the, the bottom line is that race and uh, ancestry or ethnicity capture different formation, and we can't really substitute one for the other. So uh, also there is also a, a misuse of race information in genomics in some cases, you know, or, uh, uh, for example, sometimes we try to compare uh, different uh, racial groups using genetic data. So unless we have really a very uh, similar uh, uh, background or underlying condition, given variation in the socio-environmental uh, factors, it's really uh, not reliable to compare race uh, just for the mere comparison because we are we are not having all the socio-environmental factors and controlling uh, as much as possible to get the, the distinction between racial groups. And in other cases, uh, it's not appropriate to use uh, genomic information uh, using risk uh, in, in some of the social factors, including uh, health insurance. So now I go back to my uh, research area. I get what I give you is a very brief uh, out, out, outline of race, ethnicity, and, and ancestry. So how we overlay this into asthma research. So uh, uh, as you know, asthma is one of the <clears throat> one of the condition which affects uh, over 11 million children in the U.S. And uh, there is a, you know, you can look at the hospital admission over 135,000 uh, of 40 million missed school per year. And you can imagine uh, uh, parent uh, miss jobs as well as, uh, to care their kids. And there's uh, people dying from asthma every day. So the bottom line, the economic cost of asthma is over 82 billion cost to the US economy. Here in the state of Ohio, uh, one in six children is uh, asthmatic. It's basically uh, the, 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 the difference as you can see in this, uh, in this cartoon is a, a normal breathing uh, airway uh, without any construction, whereas asthmatic uh, asthmatic individual uh, produce a high amount mucus with uh, difficult to breathe because of the constructing of the airways. So uh, asthma differs globally, as you can see, the global uh, variation uh, in terms of asthma. So there is a difference in terms of geography. And in the US, if you can, uh, you can see that the states with uh, different, uh, different proportion of uh, uh, asthma, asthma risk in different states. Uh, and and, and uh, this is for the white population, for the black population. This is, you know, uh, in terms uh, based on a state difference in the US. And, and in, in terms of race, in general, this is just the average US uh, racial difference, uh, considering all states together. You can see that uh, blacks, uh, you know, the, the, the it somehow it's stabilized and and now it's 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 uh, relatively uh, at the, the it's not increasing at uh, it's, it's still is high not 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 decreasing that fast but you can see that blacks are consistently at the higher risk than uh, than white and and and, uh, and Hispanic I should mention that Hispanic is also uh, uh, it's, it's a multi ancestry population if you look at Puerto Rico, actually Puerto Rico is uh, higher in terms of risk above even higher than the black. So uh, this is uh, really a highly admixed uh, multi-ancestral population and Puerto Ricans are actually the highest in this, in this, in the risk level. So asthma is also differed by sex. Uh, as you can see in this cartoon again, uh, before poverty, boys are at the highest 
higher risk, whereas after puberty age 15, uh, girls are at or uh, women are at, at the higher risk. So asthma is also sex uh, dependent in terms of risk. So uh, one of the things that uh, you may be interested to look is that asthma is one of the most racially disparate diseases uh, in all kinds of diseases that we know. So you can see COPD is one of the uh, you know, uh, most common uh, respiratory uh, uh, diseases. Uh, uh, but if you look at between population, it's not as high as asthma. Asthma is really racially uh, uh, very distinct in terms of uh, uh, risk. So there is a high room to improve this difference, at least to reduce this disparity uh, in asthma. So what are the risk factors? In our research, there are multiple risk factors. Of course, this is not the only risk factor, but as you can see, allergens, smoking, diet, a pollutant and infection and uh, of uh, occupation is all these are risk factor, uh, environmental risk factor for asthma. <laughs> Uh, the host factors also, you know, as I mentioned, uh, gender, uh, you know, comorbidity like obesity, and and also the, the genetic factor, and and also there's other other things we need to consider. But those are the host factor and the environmental factor that are related to asthma risk. In Cincinnati, we have really he heavy traffic here in, uh, in Cincinnati, a lot of uh, highways going through the, uh, the interstates, going through the city. So there's over 60,000 trucks. Uh, this this number is from a few years back, maybe it's now, it's by far higher than that. But you can imagine the pollution coming out of just from trucks. And, and there is uh, one of, Cincinnati is one of the really heavily uh, affected uh, region in, uh, or city in terms of asthma. There is also a lot of pollution around. So there is a, as a result, there is a high risk of asthma uh, around Cincinnati. So as a result, uh, to 20 years, uh, 22 years ago, actually, Dr. Nero Horshi uh, started this cohort. We call it GCPCR, the Greater Cincinnati Pediatric uh, Clinic Repository. Uh, you know, we have this geocoded uh, across this, uh, around this metro uh, area. And there's right now over 8,000 samples, uh, uh, you know, uh, collected in various clinic uh, in the Cincinnati Children Hospital. There are uh, around 10 clinics around, uh, but, but we have all these uh, samples uh, with biological and non-biological uh, uh, measures, including, you know, lung function, skin protest, uh, socioeconomic status, uh, insurance, and biologic measure. And in most of the sample, not all of them, we have uh, longitudinal actually. Uh, data as well. So what are we doing with this sample? As I mentioned, we, we measure exposure, the uh, uh, DEP, diesel exposed exhaust particles, including PM2.5, ACAT, and others. We have also outdoor measures, pollen mold, the indoor measures, and the smoking and uh, home assessment. We have also this uh, uh, cooking, uh, cooling system, heating system of the house, how old the house is, uh, pet, whether the person has dog or cat, or, and all, all other factors that really goes into the indoor and outdoor environment. <clears throat> so we have outcomes uh, of various types. Most are related to allergy. So as you can imagine, they have this uh, really very uh, 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 resource intensive and 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 uh, detailed environmental factors. Besides this environmental exposure, we have a clinical data. So uh, as as you imagine, all the clinical data, Ig or the skin part test or lung function and others uh, data. So in my research, we primarily focus on asthma, but uh, uh, there are other people who are uh, using eczema, for example, as an outcome and and uh, and orange uh, granitis and others. So we have really uh, a lot of out, uh, outcomes and, and exposure measures. So uh, in terms of genetics of my own research, uh, that this I'm not going to tell you everything because this is really uh, genetic 101 for uh, for most uh, uh, students here. So uh, all this started from, uh, uh, you know, early 1980s. A lot of, uh, I remember in graduate school uh, in the early 90s with RFLP. 
now uh, I, I don't think even even this is uh, uh, exist in the in in any of those suppliers. In any case, uh, for this study, we use uh, genome-wide association and admixture study, and then finally we did a joint analysis of uh, admixture and association. So uh, this is a study uh, I, I just mentioned. We have admixture study because primarily we focus on admixed population, which is African American, and we are using admixture mapping and genome-wide association just for the same sample because association captures those loci which are most similar between ancestry. So the assumption under GWAS is there is no ancestry difference. There's homogeneity. Whereas admixture captures, there is difference within a given sample in a certain loci. So these two are really complementary in, in mapping uh, genetic loci, especially if you have admixed population. Admixed population could be African-American or Latino or Hispanic. Uh, as you probably know, Hispanic is a through admixture, the methodology a little bit complicated, but still uh, it's an admix and you can use some of the tools that are available out there. So I'll give you a little bit on admix population. So uh, racial admix population is a result of uh, continental admixture. For example, in African American, uh, you know, uh, 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 part of the ancestor is from European, part of the ancestor uh, is from African as a result of slavery. And in North America or South America, you see uh, uh, var gradient variation, the gradients of uh, skin color, if you take skin color, as a result of those admixture going on. But being an admix uh, for genetic study, there is, uh, as I mentioned, there is opportunities uh, to to really use the same population for various study. But also there is also challenge how we really use methodologically because of the heterogeneity that's coming from variation in, in terms of ancestry. So for African American, as I mentioned. <laughs> Primarily African American. If you see somebody on the street and consider himself African American, on average, that person or that individual is about 20% of his ancestry is from European uh, ancestry, and 80% is uh, from Africa. So the, on average, so the variation could be from zero to 100. But on average, it, that's what uh, uh, literature and our own research shows us. So uh, what, what's interesting with admix population is that uh, asthma is more prevalent in African uh, ancestry, or multiple sclerosis is in European ancestry. And what happened if you have admix? So instead of going through all the genome, like uh, in uh, dense genomide data, you can focus actually 80% of the genome to look at for asthma because these are most commonly coming from African. The assumption is those loci are mostly from uh, African uh, part of the genome. So there is a methodological advantage in terms of power and other things that uh, we can discuss later. So this is the, first, the general approach uh, that I mentioned. You have African ancestry, European person, and the admixture and somebody in African American is basically uh, uh, at this point uh, you will find some mosaic genome from two different uh, genomic composition. Someone we consider uh, Latino is a combination of three of this ancestral population, and you will find some of this mosaic chromosome in, in Latino individual. So this is our result. Uh, from the GCPCR, the, sa the sample is uh, the sample size is about uh, 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 close to 3,000. We we remove some of the, the outliers from this. Uh, the final sample size is around 2,855. Uh, but this is you know this is the reference ancestral population CEC. I'm sorry, it should be CEU, a European ancestry from uh, you know thousand genome. And this is YRI from uh, uh, African ancestry, Yoruba from Africa. This is from reference population. So the African American population is, is this in the middle. You can see the highest proportion, which is 90, 80% on average is from uh, Yoruba. And the rest is, is from uh, uh, CEU, from uh, European ancestry. So this is 
probably looking, you know, on, on the x-axis is, is, is individual, you know, this is uh, subjects. On the y-axis is a percent proportion of ancestry. So we looked at some of, this is a preliminary data. Uh, uh, some, th this is, uh, uh, th sorry, this is a paper published uh, before that result. The result is, uh, th this is from the previous publication we had, not from the, da not the data from this one, but in any case, what we found from the uh, ancestry analysis based on global ancestry, as you can see, uh, skin positive, that means you have the allergy and they have a higher African ancestry. And uh, also if you look at IgE, and you have also uh, a higher ancestry. This is a proportion of African ancestry. Uh, as you get, as you get, uh, uh, as you as as you have higher ancestry, you expect a higher proportion of uh, a higher IgE value. So this is uh, the sample size. This is based on uh, uh, dbGaF data, actually sharp uh, data. And the sample size, I believe, is about 450. So in any case. Uh, we see uh, 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 African ancestry is, is correlated highly with Ig and positive skin per test. And uh, we also look at the elemental carbon uh, uh, exposure uh, and it's not a conclusive uh, uh, evidence that there is high correlation, but the indication is that as you have more African ancestry, you have proportionally higher ECAT. So uh, we, are, we, are, we are now running with a bigger sample size uh, with this, uh, this variable. But as you can see, there is a trend is there, but it's not uh, significant yet. And uh, for those who are interested in the other studies, this is a study that appeared in uh, New England Medicine of Genetics uh, almost 10 years ago. So you can see that, you know, as your African ancestry proportion increase, your FEVY uh, one uh, decrease. So, uh, so uh, the, 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 the authors, uh, Dr. Pritchard described actually very nicely, uh, I commend uh, anyone who haven't seen this paper, because, you know, if you look, this, this is a range of variation with an African American. So uh, somebody with this level of you know, African ancestry, you can see how his FEV or her FEV value would be. And someone with almost 90% of African ancestry he has pretty much uh, uh, low FEV, which is a measure of uh, lung function. So uh, really having, putting all this in one box in self-reported dress is, is really very, very challenging. So uh, from the uh, current study we did, uh, JUAS, uh, this is a JUAS study, and you can see it's, uh, it, there's no a lot of significant variants, but we thought, you know, uh, this is admix population and admixture is the best uh, uh, approach to go ahead, but eventually we are going to uh, run joint analysis. So there is no much uh, outliers in this uh, ROC curve. So what we did, this is uh, partly published, this methodology, we call it a CFAS. You know, from GWAS study, we have uh, identified SNPs, but it's based on genotyping. And then we expand using LED expansion from GWAS study. We expand to, 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 to uh, using LED. Uh, and, and of course, we uh, uh, use some of the functional annotation data, the GTX encode and roadmap. And, and we develop a composite functional association, we call it CFAS. So the composite functional annotation score. We basically created a score that has all these different functional data because this, this brings a different, different kind of data, brings different uh, information. So we develop this one and, and uh, we overlay with cell types and we run some of the uh, uh, methylation, uh, uh, the, 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 the CPG analysis for those uh, uh, selected variants uh, using our own uh, pyro sequencing core. So the, this is a kind of follow-up we did for some of the variants that we have in the study. 
So uh, I'll conclude with some uh, remarks with the polygenic score. Uh, uh, you know, these days polygenic score is becoming a, a mainstream in a, in, a, in a genetic study because of the people see its clinical value as a, a risk stratification or prediction. Uh, in some in some cases, it may be useful for clinical settings. So how we develop uh, the polygenic score? Basically, you know, you have a JOAS result. You select, uh, you know, you select SNP markers. This could be based on high significance or uh, significance or some other measures. People use the whole entire SNP, or you select the top hundred or thousand, or you know, depending on whatever you are interested in. And you have the effect size. The effect size comes from the previous study. The problem with uh, uh, with PRS is that you know, for minority population where there is no genomic study, uh, it's, a, it's a challenge how we use uh, this information. And most uh, current PRS are based on European descent uh, samples. So what's the problem? Uh, the problem is those uh, P PRS are not transferable to to other racial uh, groups because of, uh, as you know, you know, LED structure, the, the causal variant may be different, effect size, is that's why the effect size is different than the, the one we are using to construct uh, PRS maybe it's not holding the same. So the frequency as a result of, as uh, you know, uh, Dr. Colin mentioned that there's uh, this stochastic difference in the frequency. Those are different between racial groups. So the, 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 the conclusion is that including uh, diverse population is, is, is really critical uh, to advance uh, discovery, especially in, in the clinical setting. So this is a good example from the literature. You know, if you have a Jewish uh, in European ancestry population, uh, you can see how far you, you, you diluted. You know, the significant SNP here is really highly diluted when it reached to uh, uh, sub uh, sub-Saharan Africa. So it's really it's not close enough to to. Uh, to, to transfer studies that are based on European to other ancestral population. As a result, we need to expand our study in minority population. A good example is that, you know, uh, I look at the uh, the, the, the Jewish catalog. If you look at here, uh, you know, European ancestry is almost entirely in most studies are uh, based on European ancestry. So uh, it, it tells you how far we need to travel to capture the diversity in other racial groups, especially in the, in the idea of uh, precision medicine initiative that was uh, announced a few years back uh, by uh, President Obama. So, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the target is uh, traditional medicine, as you know, we tar treat according to phenotype. So if when I tell you phenotype in asthma, asthma is an umbrella term. There are multiple endotypes. So it's really we are not uh, getting close to the, the endotype when you treat a phenotype. So the idea of precision medicine is uh, the right drug, right dose and right time. So this combination can be possible if you use all these multi uh, omics uh, scenarios. Uh, our approach, I didn't mention the reference here. We just published this a few months ago. Uh, but uh, uh, these are the various things we need to consider in in our uh, in our efforts to change to progress from diagnosis to precision medicine. So it's from environment, from ancestry, from uh, you know, uh, as I mentioned, gender difference is important. We need to take all these different factors and measure the biologics. You know, the omics, different omics. Uh, and utilize some of the uh, tools that is coming in. Uh, I know the, the integration aspect is not well defined or developed, but I think we are uh, heading to that way. And uh, having all these different uh, variables in our efforts will eventually lead us to stratify uh, endotype based approach. Like, you know, we basically end up giving the right dose, the right time the, to the right person at the right time. So in concluding, uh, race and ancestry uh, capture different formation and cannot be substitute each other, as I mentioned. So emphasizing group difference based on ancestry, in some cases, will lead further disparities in health. 
this is really critical and some uh, we, we don't really need to emphasize uh, our study using ancestry because we know ancestry is not the everything so we need to really pay attention to other factors uh, i understand ancestry play a role but it's not the root cause of health disparities uh, one of the things i I presented to the Cincinnati Children uh, uh, Board last Saturday was about this uh, ancestry versus environment in COVID disparities. So if you look at uh, the, the, uh, the, the population in Africa and uh, black in Africa and black in the US, you have this magnitude of uh, magnitude very different in terms of COVID uh, uh, disparities. Almost uh, in Africa, 1.434 billion people, uh, there are only 52,000 uh, dead so far. But in the US, you can, you can, you know, the, the numbers. So those couldn't be really due to ancestry. We need to tackle those of those environmental, socio-environmental factors, which could contribute actually much more than the ancestry. So, uh, so I think uh, the, the bottom line is we need to take both into account. And, and, and another note is that genes may be predisposed to us to a disease, but uh, it, it doesn't cause really the disease. Environment and gene together with the interaction actually cause the phenotype, which is, 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 is a cause for the disease. So uh, the other minor point is red definition and interpretation vary uh, through time and space. So if you look at race definition, in, in Brazil or in, in other countries is different than in in, uh, in uh, Cuba or here in the US. So those are really not reliable marker of uh, uh, markers to consider. So future direction uh, uh, some, for some of the uh, group people interested in here is that we know we measure genomic information at the highest level, or at least uh, as we know now it. The problem so far is we don't know much well about the phenotype and the environmental exposure. We always talk about environment, but we don't have really uh, precise measures and a consistent measure that we everybody can take uh, can measure the same way. So I think phenotype and environment exposure would be the, 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 the future on the frontier as now. As we learn more and more omics, we really don't know much about this uh, phenotype and environment. And deep phenotyping is, is a limiting factor. And, and and as you, we need multi-layer data, longitudinal, detailed measure of environmental exposure, and of course we need a harmonization of uh, clinical data. So when you talk about uh, polygenic risk score, we need to consider clinical environment, genetic risk, and interaction factors altogether. So the final point is really we need to uh, explore further racial diverse population as we move to precision medicine. And precision medicine in asthma requires precision inference of ancestry, environment, and, and phenotype. So the, finally, I would like to thank my own love and my collaborators, uh, children and uh, uh, other in Israel. Uh, some of the funding come from children, Cincinnati Children and, and CEG, CEG, the Center for Environmental Genetics uh, here at the University of Cincinnati Environmental Health. We also have a Center for Pediatric uh, Genomics uh, support and uh, from the NIH. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, I would be happy to discuss uh, if you have uh, any, any questions. Thank you again. Thanks, Tess. That was a really great seminar. Um, really nice illustration of the, you know, the importance of both the genetic ancestry and the, the use of race. So um, I hadn't thought much, to be honest, about the, the different use of each. It's, is it fair to say it's probably oversimplification, but genetic ancestry is more important than um, teasing apart the genetic um, causes and, and effects, whereas race is more important for the environmental effects? Yes, yes, I think uh, you are right. Uh, uh, 
res is capturing mostly the environmental side because those are you know how where we live the environmental factor the the the, the, the neighborhood factor everything comes from res and mostly res is not everywhere but live on se segregated environment and those environmental factors uh, can be captured from race information. Yeah, um, other questions? Yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed your talk uh, a lot. Thank you so much. I just wonder if you could, you know, I saw that map of Cincinnati uh, you had down there with all those dots on it. I mean, you know, I wonder if you could comment a little bit on, you know, the work in the field and how difficult it is to pull these kinds of data together. Uh, you mean the data? Yeah, you know, it looks like a lot of work. Yes, yes. I think, uh, as you probably know, uh, uh, children uh, gives a lot of resources and emphasis in research. Uh, I have, in my, in my uh, own experience, little experience. I traveled a lot of other places, worked at different countries. Uh, I, I work in Israel, in Germany. I grew up in Ethiopia. And uh, I work in the US in uh, Birmingham and also in uh, Milwaukee. I never seen a resource and collaboration like in children. So there are people staying here more than 20, 30 years. And like uh, Dr. Niru Hershey, she has been here over 20 years, she, right? Uh, she came here, she established this uh, cohort and it was a really a good setting uh, at the very beginning 20 years ago. Now we have over 8,000, that's just one cohort. And Mark Rothenberg is another leader. He has also EOE and he has a big another cohort and the environmental health through the CEG and also a uh, uh, birds cohort, we call it CAPS. Uh, there's a lot of resources in, in terms of uh, exposure and clinical data. Uh, I, 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 myself is uh, every day uh, very impressed when I see here some talks here and, and, and the environment is really good to collaborate and people are really uh, happy to share their data or their uh, samples and uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, the, the other point is uh, that Cincinnati geographically, there's a lot of exposures associated to environmental factors and that setting probably uh, recognized by NIH, there's a, a, a funding related to that as well. Yeah, this is really an, an amazing cohort, very unique. It's a, a huge amount of work put into to capturing all of that environmental and genetic data. Yeah, thanks, it's a lot. And I know I used to do some work with those guys down at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. So of course, you know, and Maureen is our Cincinnati lady. So yeah, Tess and I missed each other by about two yeah. years. <laughs> yeah, so it's just really, I worked with this fellow, Tracy Glosser over there and it's really, really quite, he does epilepsy work. It's really great place. So. Uh, you know, it's an important point that the uh, institution has such an important role in, in partnering with the researchers to build and maintain these resources. So I think, uh, you know, this is a really good example of that and shows what you can do with it. And Thanks. I can attest firsthand how bad allergies are in Cincinnati. <laughs> My own personal allergies were much worse when I lived down there, when I moved up to Michigan. Something about all of the, the hills and the valleys, I think. Yeah. Things yeah, the pollen and all, everything just kind of sits in the valleys. And, yes. Um, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Huh. Thanks. Oh so, yeah, there's a lot of research in that area. I think down there, isn't there? I, I remember I collaborated with some people on, um, um, yeah, asthma and uh, allergic uh, dermatitis and yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, having un the university next to the children is also a good thing. Students can come here to children and uh, there's a really, really good collaboration and the system is really working well uh, between children and the university. So for our students, are there um, anyone looking for postdocs down there related to bioinformatics? Yeah, we, uh, the, one student, he's he's planning to graduate in uh, not soon May, 
uh, that he's in a BMI. Who, who the, the person I mentioned to you, to you he's a first author on uh, uh, machine learning and AHR data. He's graduating in May. Oh, I meant the opposite direction. <laughs> oh, yeah. If, if the, <laughs> we can look at both, though. But yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> No, I'm looking actually a postdoc if there is anyone. Okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, if somebody is interested in uh, in uh, in the, this environmental, especially mapping the environmental variables to the genetics and uh, all these factors, I'm looking. Uh, uh, yeah, we definitely have a strong statistical genetics group here. Yeah, I know Michigan is. is uh, the best place in statistical genetics. And uh, yeah, I know that all the tools come from Michigan. <laughs> well, I don't know about all, but some of them definitely. So thanks, guys. I got to go, but thank, thanks for oh, the, Thank you so much for yeah, thank you. I enjoyed it very so much. I, go ahead, Maureen. I, just, I believe the know. students um, stay on, can stay on to meet with him. Is that, that's correct, Aaron? Sure. Aaron? Um, is that how we're doing it? They're welcome to. I don't actually know how Jane set it up. Um, yeah, I guess did Jane explain it to you, Tess? Yes, yes. So uh, uh, she, she told me to wait uh, and and uh, talk to. Yeah. Seth. You might have a um, yeah a break in between because I think it wasn't supposed to start till five fifteen. Okay, so, uh, I'll um, be back. The same line. Yeah. The same... And I know one particular student was really interested in meeting with you, and I don't see her here yet. So. Can I, yeah, um, Tess, before you leave, can I ask you a question? Oh, um, yeah, please. I really enjoyed your talk. Fan fantastic work. Um, oh, I was curious um, about the, the distinction between race and ancestry. I hadn't really thought about that, but, it, you know, it makes sense. I was curious, has anyone ever tried to predict one from the other? Like 23andMe self-reported race, predict it from, from DNA. Is you know, what, if you do that, what what kind of accuracy do you get? Yeah, the we did some uh, you know just simple correlation, self-reported versus uh, global ancestry. Uh, there is there is a, a lot of report that uh, uh, shows a really a mismatch, but in our case, I think the correlation we got is about about 0.6. Between self-reported and and uh, um, uh, ancestry determined the global ancestry, That's so uh, uh, you know, 0.6. It's a uh, in genetic study. It's a big uh, maybe you know, for epidemiologic study, it may not be a big uh, uh, self-reported rate could be uh, valuable for you know social epidemiology study. But for a genetic study, really, it's a, it's, you know, it's a big uh, gap between self-reported versus um, uh, genetically reported or determined. Hmm. That's interesting. It's probably different. The correlation is probably different depending on which race you're looking at, too, potentially, right? Yeah. If you look, uh, in our case, we look at African American. Uh, if you uh, if you aren't uh, somebody look probably can look the Hispanic. The Hispanic is a three word mixture in the Latino. Uh, uh, they could have you know black, white, and and uh, Native American ancestry within their genome. So, self reported, uh, you know may may not really explain why because if you look at the uh, puerto rican they have a higher black genome than if you look at mexican so it depends which which uh, uh, really yeah uh, i would say the geographic or country you consider because puerto rican they have over 46 percent of african ancestry whereas mexicans i think less than five or ten percent of black ancestry Hmm. That's interesting. Great. Well, thanks again. I'm going to sign off. <laughs>